three, two, one, you can start. Hello, everybody. Um, it's morning in Cameroon, and um, I want to welcome you all to this um, third Global Mental Health Pay Network Africa um, webinar, right? Um, we are going to be listening from wonderful speakers today, and of course, from the Global Mental Health Pay Network um, um, executive and they'll tell us about the Global Mental Health Pain Network, and then we are going to dive straight into our topic because it's a very interesting one. My name is Maria Banga, and I'm the country executive for Cameroon, and I'm also the regional representative of Africa, well, on my way out. So this is really an exciting um, event for me because it's my last one as the regional rep Africa. And I really wanted us to talk about this, about stigma and its effect on mental health in Africa. Um, we are going to be hearing from uh, Professor Graham. He's such a renowned expert. I don't even know how to introduce him. We are going to be hearing from other pairs because I wanted us to be comfortable talking about our lived experiences and what we have observed. And then we are going to um, get questions and answers and comments from people. We're going to try to keep this at one hour and a half. But I mean, if we get to two hours or one forty-five. I think it's just going to be as interesting. I want to thank everybody who uh, has joined and who is going to join us. It is so um, to the soul that people take off time to do this and um, that um, in spite of the pandemic and the stress and the, I don't know how I can even say it, the uncertainty and the everything, we still come together like this. That means that the pandemic has not defeated us. That means that even a mental health challenge or condition shouldn't defeat us. That means that nothing should keep us down. And that's why I feel like when we talk about our lived experiences, when we talk about even our mental health struggles, when we talk about even those of loved ones, we can only go ahead. We cannot get back. So we are really hoping that people are going to go away from this webinar with that um, zeal to keep talking and not to be silenced. I watched a show and somebody was asking the participant, were you sheltered or were you silenced? And the participant said she was silenced and it hurt so bad. And uh, sometimes we don't know what our actions or our reactions do to other people to silence them. So stigma, from my perspective as a psychotherapist, as a person with a lived experience and all of that, it can come from within and it can come from out. We are going to listen to people who talk about stigma from within. I was a hostage to stigma from within and I still deal with that, but I can manage it very well. And then there are people who are hostages to stigma from the outside at the workplace and all of that. So without taking so much time, I'm going to um, invite Claudia. Claudia is the deputy uh, CEO for the Global Mental Health Pain Network. I joined this wonderful network in 2018 and I've risen to honorary member and honorary mentor. It's a wonderful place to belong. So um, Claudia, I can't, I can't do more justice talking about the network than yourself. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so my name is Claudia, as Marie rightfully said, uh, Deputy CEO of the Global Mental Health Peer Network. Um, so I think it's important um, to talk a little bit about what the peer network does, um, what our work is really trying to achieve. So to start at the basics, um, the Peer Network is a, a registered nonprofit organization registered under the South African laws. However, it does have a global presence. So we are currently, our executive committee is currently covering 34 countries um, and we're over 80 lived experience individuals. And um, we are, every day we're getting new applications for more representation through our network, which is amazing. And I think it's webinars such as this that also speaks volumes as to what we do. So we are, we cover the five, five out of six of the World Health Organization regions, and we are a hundred percent lived experience um, organization. We pride ourselves in the fact that all of our members from our volunteers through to our executive committees, our regional leads, um, as well as the, the global office, such as myself, 
our project assistants and the CEO, we all have lived experience, which means that each one of us in our organization has the opportunity to bring forth um, challenges and perspectives based on their personal experience with mental health. And we bring those, those perspectives to discussions that are held at high levels, that are held with other stakeholders. And it's these perspectives and experiences that impact on policy, that impacts on practices, um, that ultimately the aim is to, to change the status quo and to ensure that everybody, including those with lived experience of mental health conditions, that they be treated equally in the world, that they receive equal high quality care and services, and that we are essentially one voice and one big community. Um, and, and I just, I hope that um, if there's anybody that's interested in, in hearing more about the peer network, um, you can reach out to me separately, but for now I will hand it over back to Marie. Uh, thank you so much for letting me introduce the peer network. Wow, Claudia, that was very brief, very spot on. What I take away from what you have said is that um, it is it is more of like a family of people who know what it means to go through stuff. I will just use that word. And so can hold space for each other and say, let's do this together. And I want to say, I joined in August 2018 and never have I for once regretted joining. You know, like I left social media for the month of May and I stayed on the group on WhatsApp. I even left my, my school. I left my family groups. I left all groups. I stayed on the GMHPN. That's how close the GMHPN it is, is, is to my heart. So I'm just happy that I'm growing in the network and I'm happy for, for the CEO, Shalene. When the crisis just started, I, I got under the radar again because I live with post-traumatic stress disorder. So any trauma, any stress can get me overboard. I mean, just any, including an assignment in school, I can have an anxiety attack. I had one recently. So I always reach out to Charlene every now and then. And that time she there was a, a support group she set up, but people weren't really coming together. So I said, Charlene, I'm not going to wait for the next group. I'm really struggling. So she said, okay, let's talk. And we did talk for like an hour and it meant so much to me. And uh, so it's, it's really wonderful. And I hope that um, people who are ready to join such a, a network to join. There's really no hit, no judgment. And I, I really appreciate that. Charlene actually even goes an extra mile to get us some renowned speakers if you ask her. And so when I reached out to her and I was like, who can we invite, you know, to talk to us about stigma? She said, Graham, I, I did not know who he was. Please bear with me, Prof, but I just have to be honest. And so she said, well, go Google him. And I Googled and I was like, oh, is he going to come? And she said, yes, he will come. I said, okay, Charlene, do the introduction. <laughs> and so Charlene did, and it's just been wonderful since then. You know, I'm actually looking forward to doing a PhD someday and have the professor supervise me. Please pray for me for that. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce him. He is a Sir Graham Tony Crop. He's a professor of community psychiatry at the Center for Global Mental Health Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, King's College London. I want to get there. He also works as a consultant psychiatrist at South London and Motley um, NHS, that's the National Health Service Foundation Trust in the local community mental health team in Lambeth. He is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences is a National Institute of Health Research Senior Investigator Emeritus <laughs> and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, King's College, London, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists. He is the director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Research and Teaching at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience. If I get to one tenth of that, I will have tried. Graham took his undergraduate degree at Cambridge in social and political sciences, studied medicine at Guy's Hospital, London, and then trained in psychiatry at the Mosley and Johns Hopkins Hospital. I don't think I was born by then. 
He gained an MSc in Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a PhD at the University of London. Graham has made significant contributions to the development of mental health policy in England, including chairing the External Reference Group for the National Service Framework for Mental Health, the National Mental Health Plan for England for 99 to 2009. I'm learning. He is also active in global mental health. For example, he co-chaired the World Health Organization Guideline Development Group for the Mental Health Gap Action Program, MHGAP. Intervention Guide, first and second editions, a practical support for primary care staff to treat people with mental, neurological, and substance use disorders in low and middle incomes, which is now used in over 100 countries worldwide. He also chaired the external reference group for the WHO guidelines on the management of physical health conditions in adults with severe mental disorders. His area of research expertise includes stigma and discrimination. Charlene was 100% right. Evaluations of mental health treatments, services and systems, implementation science and global mental health. Graham has authored over, yes, 30 books <laughs> and over 540 peer reviewed papers in PubMed. <laughs> Graham received a knighthood in the Queen's Birthday Honours Award in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands and hearts together. Thank you so much, Prof, for accepting to do this for us. You know, it's not like back in those days when you fly people and put them in five stars and that would be incentive enough. Thank you, over to you, Prof. Well, what a very kind introduction, Mary. That's really very, very nice of you, thank you. And um, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to be invited to join you for this webinar. And I've heard a lot about the Global Mental Health Peer Network, all of it's really good. And I've heard from Charlene uh, a little bit about your work. So it's a real honor for me to be invited today. So uh, I won't say anything more about myself um, because you've heard something uh, from Marie. So the next step then is for me to do share screen and then see if I can get the right slide on your screen. And I want to make it a full screen display. So let me check, Marie, if you can see the title slide. Um, yes, or Claudia, got thumbs up, okay. And just to test it, first of all, um, can you see a picture saying reaction at the top? Can Maria give you a Claudia if you can put a thumb up, if you can? Great. OK, right. So we're in business. So my title is uh, Stigma and its Effects uh, on Mental Health in Africa. And I think probably at the beginning, uh, I should say that uh, you are experts on mental health in Africa uh, and I am not. Um, but I do know quite a bit about stigma. So I'll tell you about what I do know and a little bit about some of the work I've been involved in in a few African countries. And I also look forward to our discussion um, where I hope I can learn as much as um, teach if you like. So this picture uh, gives you a sense of what I'm going to be talking about. This is an example from my country, from England, and this is a reaction to a proposal to create a community mental health center. And you can see there's a protest, there's a placard, there was a petition, there was opposition to the very idea of creating, in this case, a community mental health service. So I'm going to just talk more about what's behind stigma and more particularly about what we can do. What do we have evidence to know how to do stigma? So I'm going to talk first of all about some disclosures, then about the evidence for stigma reduction, and some examples, particularly examples from different African countries. Disclosures then. In many countries now, not all, but in many, it's becoming more possible to speak about having or having had uh, mental health difficulties. 
some of you may have come across Chimamanda Adichie, who's a, a brilliant writer, and she's also spoken uh, very eloquently about her own depression, and interestingly, um, gone back to brilliant writing after episodes of depression, including prize-winning uh, creative achievements. Um, some people I wouldn't have expected um, to have had difficulties, nevertheless have spoken out, including Michelle Obama, about some of the problems she's had in recent years, and that she looked for help and got help, and then felt better and recovered. And this is uh, one of the most famous film stars at the moment in Bollywood, in India, and Deepika Padukone. And she's talked a lot about having periods of deep depression and periods of full recovery. There's actually a lot now in, particularly in high income countries, covering mental health issues. This is about a football um, star uh, in the United States. And this is the man who in the last year was the world's uh, richest earning male film star, Dwayne Johnson. And he's famous for these big muscular hero pictures, action movies. But also he's talked a lot about the fact that he's had quite a few periods of severe depression as well. This is the man who in my country and among um, young people, <laughs> not me, but the young people, uh, is now really well known. He's called Stormzy and he's a singer. And he now is at the top of the bill of big uh, music festivals. And again, he's talked about his mental health problems very openly, both in public appearances, but also in the lyrics of his music. Prof, excuse me. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but the, uh, there's a hand up and secondly, a comment came in to say your slides were in turning. I think uh, you're forgetting to do that. Okay, all right. Now, do they, uh, good, thank you for letting me know. So. That's important. So can you see now um, the, let's say down to, uh, and I'll just have to go back and take you through the pictures of what I'm talking about. So can you see the one with the children in the placard? Yeah, okay. All right. So then um, what I've just mentioned is about this writer from Nigeria and that's her prize winning. This is Michelle Obama. Can you see the Michelle Obama picture? Okay, great. So I think we're on track now. Sorry, a slight technical hitch. Uh, this is the Indian film star. This is the American uh, football player. And here's Dwayne Johnson and one of his starring roles. And this is Stormzy, the pop singer. Okay. Can you now see Coco Gauff, the young up and coming tennis player? Okay. So She's um, also spoken about her difficulties, including the pressures of being an international sort of top athlete. And here we see that she has an astonishing run in her first um, appearance at Wimbledon. Now, this isn't for me just a theoretical issue because also I've got family experience of mental ill health. Uh, this is my mother, whose name is Rhoda. And what happened is that she, when I was very young, I was about three, I had a period of severe depression. Um, she was working as a nurse and she took, in fact, a year off sick from work, but she didn't tell her boss why she was away. She had electroconvulsive therapy <clears throat> because the drugs she was given didn't work. But fortunately, the ECT therapy did work and she made a full recovery. So at that time, this was a picture of our family, and that's me at the age of three. And recently I did a chapter for a book where I, strangely enough, I interviewed my mother. And she said that she'd lost weight. Uh, she's actually thinking of putting um, her and my and my sister's heads in a gas oven, which would have been fatal, but she didn't do that. And she did uh, ask for help. She says that, it was the worst experience of her life. She said she wouldn't wish that on her worst enemies. And she said, I hope that people are more understanding these days. Now, so stigma, I don't need to tell you about you know, what it means or how common and how severe it can be. And let's look then at the, I think the more important question is, do we know anything about how to reduce stigma? 
So I spent uh, quite a long time a few years ago looking into this when I wrote this book, which I thought would be about stigma. But in fact, uh, I focused more on the question of discrimination, and I'll tell you why. So after thinking about this quite a bit, I thought that stigma is quite a helpful general title because people react and understand and think that they know what stigma means. But in fact, I think it's more useful to break it down into three component parts. Problems of knowledge, problems of attitudes, and problems of behavior. And the knowledge is that most people are really lacking in accurate information about mental health problems, so it's ignorance. The attitude question is about our feelings, which are almost entirely negative among most people in the population towards people with mental ill health. And it's the behavioral side that I think is even more important that I call discrimination. Why? Because that leads you to have a job or to keep a job or not, or to have a partner or contact with your family or not. So I became more interested in the actual change in everyday lives in the discrimination area. So when I began to work on research about stigma and discrimination, this was about 12, 15 years ago, we began to develop a network of people involved and interested in this. Nearly all the work we've done until recently was not funded. So it was by voluntary working together. You can see here some of the countries that have taken part in some of these projects, including uh, several countries in the African continent as well. So one of the first things we did to begin with is we created a way to assess discrimination, not rated by experts, but discrimination rated by people with different mental health conditions. You can see here that we did a big survey over 700 people in about 23 countries, people with diagnosis of schizophrenia. And we asked them about their experiences of discrimination. Um, the second study was about people with severe depression. Now over a thousand people involved, even more countries, about 25 countries, as I recall. And what did we find? So about 80% of people with depression and about 90% of people with schizophrenia said that they had been discriminated against because of their mental condition. Commonly, this was from friends and family, but also people in the workplace and other social settings. About a third said that some friends or some family had completely cut off contact since they'd had a mental health diagnosis. But something else that we didn't expect to find was that quite a lot of people said that because they expected to fail, for example, in applying for a job, and Marie, you mentioned, you know, internalized problems, because they expected to fail, then they didn't even try to do some things which are important, like applying for a job, maybe like trying to initiate a new personal or close relationship. Sometimes this is called the why try syndrome. And we call this thing anticipated discrimination, where you think you will come across stigma discrimination, and you just can't be bothered to, to go into all that. So you don't even try, for example, to join a football team or a choir, or whatever it might be. Now, we're doing further work now, not just to describe stigma, but actually to try to do something about it. We're doing projects in several countries with staff in primary care, who are often a place where there is a lot of stigma, problems with healthcare students, including medical students, and also seeing if small local campaigns, for example, using radio jingles and newspaper advertisements, can help people to go, especially go to primary care, to get help. People are otherwise unwell, but getting no help at all. And we've just started um, a project in five different um, low and middle income countries, which is China, okay. India, Nepal, Ethiopia, and Tunisia, to further intensify the development of these interventions. One of the other things we've done is to look at the 
literature to find on how to reduce stigma. And this is called a systematic review of the evidence. And what did we find? We found that the principle of social contact is the strongest, is the best evidence-based approach to reducing stigma. And what does social contact mean? It means ways of bringing together people who have lived experience of mental health problems and people who do not. Secondly, we found that to our surprise, and we've learned this um, in the last couple of years before COVID, that indirect methods of social contact, for example, watching videos, watching testimonies on social media, uh, watching films, hearing radio, TV, indirect contact can be as powerful and as effective as direct in-person contact. For young people, there's less evidence, but it seems like social contact, in this case, in education settings like schools and colleges, can also be highly effective. But although the large majority of the world's population live in low and middle income countries, the large majority of the evidence comes from the high income countries. So until quite recently, we haven't had much information about how to effectively reduce stigma in, for example, low or in middle income countries. So if you perhaps can only remember two words from my talk today, uh, let them be this, social contact. That is the evidence of how to reduce stigma. Now, to look into this in more detail in research, <clears throat> we've developed a series of scales or assessment measures to assess knowledge and attitudes and behavior. I won't go into detail now, um, but if you're interested in this, please do contact me and I'll give you my email contact at the end. So what progress are we seeing? Well, there are, or there have been until recently, uh, several, now about 12 or 14 countries with national anti-stigma programs. And at a glance, you can see that they're all high-income countries. There are a couple of middle-income countries, for example, Chile and Ukraine and Georgia, now thinking about um, national programs but none so far in low income countries. So again, we've got to be cautious and not generalize or not overgeneralize uh, information from high to low income countries, which are clearly so different. This is uh, an example of change and stigma reduction from my country. This is a program called Time to Change. And this is in England. There's actually now a global um, Time to Change group as well. And you can see after about, um, this is after seven years, the scale of some of the improvements, 10, 15, 5%. Important areas of progress, but also we haven't, after now over 10 years in England, we haven't eradicated stigma, but we have demonstrated that stigma can change and can change for the better if you commit to stigma reduction methods. Interestingly now, not just show business, but also royal celebrities are taking a real active interest. You may have heard just the last few days about Prince Harry talking about his mental health problems and the treatment he's had, Prince William talking about his mental health difficulties and so on. So there are actually in some countries a really strong growing momentum talking about mental health issues, including now the mental health impact of COVID directly, but also indirectly, for example, on healthcare staff. I'll come now to more directly the question about stigma and African countries. Again, with the um, cautionary note that um, my experience in uh, most African countries is very limited, but I'll tell you what I've been involved with. So this is one example from Kenya, led by my colleagues Mutira Victoria Mutiso and David Netai, where they implemented guidelines from the World Health Organization 
and then looked to see if that also reduced stigma, and they found that it did. This is an example from South Africa, led by uh, Catherine Egby and colleagues and Inga Peterson uh, from UKZN. And they found that there was widespread misunderstanding and misperceptions in their assessment of stigma in that particular study in South Africa. This is a study from Nigeria, uh, led by my colleague Yuandir Shodi. And they also found that uh, there was a, a lot of evidence that discrimination and stigma were widespread. And in that case, the younger people and people with a higher education had a higher risk for experiencing discrimination. That varies. In some countries, it's people who are older or less educated who seem to be more stigmatizing or more stigmatized. Uh, this is another study from colleagues um, I worked with in Nigeria led by Bauer James. And you can see here a number of the barriers to help seeking, one of which is stigma. It's not the only barrier, but it's an important one. And you can see here that the attitudinal barriers often would stop people from seeking help or might encourage family members to say, no, no, don't go for help, don't get a diagnosis. That might bring shame upon you, but also embarrassment and shame to the whole family. So this can have important consequences for delaying or stopping access to help and care because of stigma. Now also, I've just done recently with colleagues here, led by uh, Dristi Gurung, a chapter for a book also for my colleagues in Kenya, again, David Endetai and Victoria Mutiso, about stigma in low and in middle income countries. And these were, if you like, the, the main conclusions we came to that it is one, stigma is one of the biggest barriers to seeking help, especially where help does exist, maybe in primary care, but people just often will not go for the reputational damage they expect that would happen. But it can have damaging effects at every level. Sometimes I think about stigma as a type of polluting or poisonous fog that just infiltrates ever, everywhere. It can get inside the minds of people who are affected and uh, be a source of uh, desolation or anguish. It can be detrimental to poisonous and family relationships. You don't understand the mental illness and may be harsh or critical, say you're lazy or weak or lacking in prayer and so on. It can also be damaging for the staff in uh, facilities, for example, primary health care, some of whom may be stigmatizing or may just not have had the training and feel they're able to assess or to treat people with mental difficulties. And it's a problem at the sort of largest or the macro level where policymakers and politicians simply don't want to invest in mental health because they think it's all too difficult and we don't have evidence about how to improve conditions. Now, I'm deliberately um, wanting to stress that although it looks like social contact from the evidence we have is effective, We've got to be cautious because not much evidence comes from low income countries. And we can't, of course, we can't take evidence from high and simply transplant it to other types of settings. So we do need to have more evidence from low and from middle income countries to see what works in those settings. Now, this is, I think, a particularly interesting example published by my colleagues in India. This is Palat Maulik and colleagues. And they did a very interesting study recently because it's in a rural part of Eastern India, not Africa, but it's a low income setting. And they went to 42 different villages. Uh, many of the villages have um, low or very limited literacy. And the intervention to deliver social contact was mostly through plays, small short plays put on by a small group of traveling actors. In fact, some of the actors themselves have experience of mental ill health, but often they didn't choose to say that they were playing parts. So there were assessments before and after the plays to look at the impact in stigma reduction. And they found that stigma did reduce in that particular example. And it was also reduced a year later. But they went further and did something that most people don't do, is to go back later still. In this case, after two years, 
and they found that the stigma had dropped even further. So that was really interesting that this dramatic play with some uh, handouts, mostly pictures, not words, because of the setting, did lead to a stigma reduction in a rural, low income setting. Now, time is short, and I think I should probably not take too much longer. So I'll just say that we've done further reviews about the evidence. This is one for low and mid-income countries, and that we found not much, not much evidence so far from low-income countries. This is one, uh, a review about primary care settings, and this is a review about stigma reduction for children and young people in low-income settings. I can summarize this briefly, which is that we don't yet have anything like enough evidence about how to reduce stigma. But the evidence we do does support the social contact type interventions if it's properly adapted, culturally adapted for context and for culture. Now, to put this material all together and to update it, and we hope to make strong recommendations, um, Charlene Sunkel, whom you all know, and I are now co-leading a new initiative for the Lancet Journal. And this is called a Commission on Stigma and Discrimination. And over about the next year or so, we're going to be bringing together all the information we can get about reducing stigma and making, we hope, strong recommendations about what to do. We do invite statements and experiences and views from everybody. So if you're interested in contributing anonymously um, your views, um, if you want to be named, that's your choice. And you can have the web link here, or if you simply search for Indigo, the name of the network, Stigma and Lancet Commission, you'll find the page and you can make your own uh, contribution to that. And we'll be using some of these quotes in the commission report. So to summarize what I've been wanting to say today, contact means disclosure. Disclosure can be risky, so it's got to be done under careful and thought through conditions. It's about talking. It's about talking to people who do. It's about talking to people who might have mental health problems, not keeping quiet. It's not concealment, it's disclosure. And this is the principle of stigma reduction, which is social contact. So every couple of years, um, I'm part of a group that organizes a big international meeting, or we used to, now maybe it's a big international webinar. <laughs> Uh, about stigma reduction. And uh, the last uh, recent one, the organizers made these big blocks of ice. It's, you can't see its scale. It's actually about a meter high. And you can probably see a tray at the bottom with some cables. And there was a very low heater placed under these blocks of ice. And the reason was to achieve this, which was that stigma would slowly melt away. That's a metaphor for what I want to see, actually, to move towards eradication of mental health stigma. If not in my lifetime, then as soon as we can get there. So to summarize, I've talked about some disclosures. I've talked about some of the evidence, especially emphasizing social contact. And I've spoken about examples of progress, um, several of which relate to Africa and stigma reduction in Africa. If you're interested in any of these um, materials, uh, slides, uh, papers, and so on, please do contact me. And I also, if you have access to Dropbox, have a folder with a lot of stuff about stigma, and you're very welcome to join that as well. So on that note, let me thank you again for inviting me, and I hand you back then to the chair. Thank you for your attention. I wish we could do this. <laughs> How does everyone feel? Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw somebody ask if we could have the links to the, um, what did they ask for? I think some research and some studies, and uh, I don't know how we are going to do this, but I, I, I commit to get them together, the, the, the ones I can get together and share somehow, you know, those who have registered, 
um, I can send it to a blog email. We'll figure something out uh, as a network. We, we, we really have to, because um, if we don't do this, then we are not making any progress. And as we see, the ice is so strong because even Prof says only the S has been touched somehow. So we still have a long way to go. So when I was listening to Prof, I was like, please don't think about your country. Don't think about your country. So I'm not thinking about my country, how much work we have, because we don't even have a mental health policy in my country. So honestly, I don't like thinking or talking about my country as far as mental health work is concerned. Um, we are going to open up later on. We want to just give all the speakers the opportunity to talk and share so that uh, we have all the questions and all the reactions in the chat boxes and then we just have a free free flow from there so um, if you have any um, comments on what prof has said kindly stay with us don't go because i didn't want it to be like once prof has spoken everybody asks their question and then people go and then we don't have anybody listening to our own stuff right so i want to um invite the next speaker my very able deputy you know, when you are doing something, especially the first time, because I, I, we are the first leads for the African region, so many things were first times for us, you can't do it alone. So I actually suggested that we have the regions and then we have the deputies, because there are times when you will not be in the mood to do something and then, well, you need somebody to, just like Charlene has Claudia. So I was very happy to have Angie. And the good thing is Angie is a big sister, you know, because sometimes we are Africans. When somebody is younger than you, what can they tell you? So it's always good to have a bigger sister, you know. So um, Angie is going to, Angelica, but I call her Angie. She's going to be talking about how she struggled with self-stigmatization over the years and how she has overcome it and how she helps other people. You know, that's also something I struggle with. Sometimes people will say, but you don't look sick. But because you don't want to look sick, but you feel sick. And you feel sick also because you're telling yourself, well, I'm going to feel like this. I will flunk. And so you don't even go out there to try. You know, and sometimes you don't even go for social events. You don't, just because you are holding yourself back due to your own fears, which is still stigma. So let's listen to Angie and then um, we would move on to Leila. We'll move on to Edwin. And then we are going to open the floor. And I really, really love the way it's going. Thank you so much, everyone. Angie, over to you. Thank you, Marie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, as Marie said, um, Angelica Mkorongo, and I live in Harare, Zimbabwe. And I live with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which is a disorder that um, most in most African countries, people don't understand and people don't talk about. I'm the founder of Zimbabwe OCD Trust, and um, I'm here to share my story of how self-stigma robbed me of living a full life for more than 30 years. Since I was a teenager, I started having serious intrusive thoughts that's that way unwanted, distressing, and uncontrollable. These thoughts were aggressive and often disturbing. I always felt like everyone was looking at me and laughing at me. If someone was laughing, it had to be at me. If people were talking, it had to be about me. I used to have random thoughts of hurting myself badly or people close to me. I'm not a violent person, but I used to get very violent, horrific, intrusive thoughts, which terrified me. And it got to the point where I became phobic of knives, especially when in the kitchen. It's a scary existence when you can't get away from your own mind. When my intrusive thoughts were really bad, I would picture driving off a bridge or crashing into incoming traffic. I'm not good enough. I'm an evil person. 
My family would, would be better off without me. I'm a failure. I'm the worst person in the world. I do everything wrong. Those were voices in my head and these voices would go on and on and on. The problem with self-doubt and self-stigma, at least for me, is that it stopped me from doing things. It stopped me from being with friends. It stopped me from voicing my opinion and taking part in conversations. It held me back from realizing my full potential. The pain of stigma, the pain of self-stigma is real. It tells society that my input is less than others. Because of all these thoughts, I found myself cowering in a corner, hiding from the world with serious low self-esteem. I believed I was an evil person because of these thoughts. For me, it was as if people could see through my thoughts and trying to hide from people meant they would never see what was on my mind. I began to constrict from my social networks and always anticipated rejection. And this led to isolation, depression, suicidal thoughts and alcohol abuse. One day, my elderly mother told me how she had suffered from intrusive thoughts since she was a teenager. And she asked me to take her to a priest for confession. For some reason, she believed having such thoughts was her fault. I could not tell her my own anguish for fear of distressing her. I then realized that I could be suffering from a hereditary disorder and started investigating. It took me another three years before I could find the courage to seek help. I made an appointment with a psychiatrist from my church. I remember sitting in the waiting room, praying that no one I know would walk in. My turn came. I felt shame and self loth for even going to see the psychiatrist. I started telling him my story with tears tripping down my face. When I looked up, I saw someone who looked at me with kindness and understanding. And he said, what you're going through is quite normal and you can get through this and live a normal life. Wow, that's all I needed. Someone who did not judge me, but encourage me. This is why it is so important for us to raise awareness of mental conditions. Sometimes they are not that visible to the outside world, but internally one could be suffering every single day. We radically need to shift the way we think and talk about mental health conditions. We need to talk more freely about our battles with each other. There is need for us to create safe spaces where we can share and support each other and to make sure that it is okay to talk about these issues with our children in schools and in churches. We need to make sure everyone understands that it is not anyone's fault to have a mental condition and that it can affect anyone, anytime. My story is just one example of why we need to bring more of this conversation to the table. Now is the time when we in Africa need to help each other. We need to treat mental health conditions like any other disorder and we need to treat each other with dignity. I'm going to share something or to quote um, something from the Pan-African Network of People with Psychosocial Disabilities. And I wouldn't have said it in any better way. 
we recognize that people with psychosocial disabilities have been viewed in bad ways with derogatory words being used to describe us, such as mentally disturbed, having unsound minds, idiots, lunatics, imbeciles, and many other hateful labels. We are people first. We have potentials, abilities, talents, and each of us can make a great contribution to the world. We in the past, presently and in future have the will to continue to make get great contributions if barriers are removed. We believe in an Africa in which all people are free to be themselves and to be treated with dignity. We are all different, unique, and our differences should be appreciated as an issue of diversity. We need all people to embrace this diversity. Diversity is beautiful. There can be no mental health without our expertise. We are the knowers and yet we remain the untaped resource in mental health care. We are the experts. We want to be listened to and to fully participate in our life decisions. We must be the masters of our life journeys. We want, like everyone else, to vote. We want to marry. We want to form relationships, have fulfilled family lives, raise children, and be treated as others in the workplace with an with a equal remuneration for equal work. For as long as others decide for us, we do not have rights. No one can speak for us. We want to speak for ourselves. We want to be embraced with respect and love. We want everyone to acknowledge their participation in calling us names and treating us as lesser beings. These are the barriers to our full enjoyment of life. These barriers are disabling us and these pre prevent us from fully participating in society. We wish for a better world in which all people are treated equally, a world where human rights belong to everyone. And we want to invite you to walk beside us. We know where we want to go. I thank you. Thank you, thank you. I wasn't brought up learning or thinking that I can interrupt my elders. So I was just listening with so much love and just like, if Angie goes on and on, well, I don't have any option but to let Angie go on and on. And I want to give Angie credit, you know, I like doing this when people are alive. I don't like talking good things about people when they're gone. It doesn't serve any purpose. Angie is the one who brought up this idea to have regional webinars open to the public like this in December. And um, the first two ones, she got the resource people. And um, so Angie is so much to me. I have met so many wonderful people in this global mental health pain network. I'm a global, I'm a global citizen, frankly speaking. So I really want to thank Angie. And um, the one thing I get from, from Angie's story, first of all, Angie, can you imagine you would not have shared this story if you held back? Angie was like, well, if there's nobody, then I can. And I was like, no, Angie, even if there are already two people, you would share. So I just had to, Angie, thank you so much. Don't hold back next time, just share. Okay, so um, Angie shared the first time with the tears rolling down, but now no more tears are rolling down. When you look at Angie, I don't think you can say just from looking at her that this is somebody who struggles and stuff. Myself, Claudia, um, Leila, Leila is our next speaker. She's from South Africa. And um, Leila is so cool. When, when Leila wanted to talk about something else, but I told Leila, no, somebody else is going to talk about it from that angle. So Leila said, well, then which other angle can I talk from? And she suggested, and I was like, yes, Leila, thank you so much for that. So um, Leila is going to be looking at the challenges of access and stigma within families. Each person has taking a deep breath before talking because we are Africans and we know how 
when you talk about some certain things, you might go back home and face some disciplinary committee. It's not like out there, you just talk and go and go. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody we're sharing today. Over to you, Leila. Thanks very much, Marie. And thanks, Angie. Quite a hard act to follow, <laughs> but I'll try my best. Um, and then my name is Lila Sassman. I'm um, from South Africa. Um, and I live with anxiety, depression, and ADHD. Um, just before I proceed, just because I know um, it's not just South Africans on the call, um, within South Africa, someone of my race is referred to as colored. I know that's sometimes derogatory in other countries, but it's got a particular meaning in South Africa, um, and it's got quite a strong meaning in the story that I'm going to share. So I just wanted to share that nomenclature with everyone else. Um, yeah, so I am going to share my story of stigma within the family unit and how that relates also to access um, and within the broader community, I should say. Um, so this is my story. You that don't talk, you want to be a lawyer. Why is she so much fun and you're not? These are just some examples of phrases that I've heard growing up as a young, impressionable girl. And growing up as a colored girl in Cape Town, these are the type of phrases I would hear as a painfully shy child. The generalization of colored families are that we are loud and brash and being quiet is no place in these households. Um, when I was nine years old, I had the opportunity to go to a school that was formerly only open to white girls. I'm quite old, so it was, you know, during, as apartheid was ending in South Africa. In that same year, um, my parents divorced. We moved out of my grandmother's house where we'd been living for four, for the past four years. My aunt moved to Switzerland permanently following an, um, an apartheid-related attack on a local church. I had a freak accident, which ended up me having emergency surgery one Sunday, and I ended up missing four days of school. And at no point was it considered that all these major life events might result in mental health challenges for a nine-year-old. Um, because we don't have mental health, mental health illnesses in colored families, and children of those families definitely don't. Um, in high school and university, I struggled with self-harm and suicidality, but no one ever notices the quiet girl, the girl who really had social anxiety without knowing it. And definitely no one in my family noticed my struggles with rejection, because in my family, the expectation is that if you have struggles, you wash your face and it will all go away. And despite studying psychology and even, and even though I would regularly self-diagnose, I never once thought that I actually had a mental illness because we don't have mental illness. No one in my family at any point in my youth, not even when I was experiencing all these challenges, not when I struggled with issues of identity in high school and not being accepted by my peers nor my family because I had the wrong accent. Having gone to the school I went to, I spoke too fancy for my cousins. And people of color do not have mental illnesses like depression and anxiety. It's a white person's illness. However, I have suffered with anxiety and depression and ADHD since I was roughly four years old. But because it's not a language that we use in families like mine, it went unnoticed. I was just the shy kid and I thought that was normal, but it has hindered every aspect of my life. It has stopped relationships. It has stopped me from having success at work. Uh, it has stopped me from having su success um, at school and university. I've, the feedback I get in all these areas are, I have high potential, a potential that I never meet. And while I, was, while I was studying psychology, as I was learning about this, I would encourage my mother to get treatment for anxiety because she has quite severe anxiety herself, but she did not go. And even though I asked her if she had diabetes, would she refuse to go to a doctor? She said no. And I asked her why she's doing that with her anxiety. She had no answer, but she still has not sought treatment. This is about 20 years later. It is not an illness we have and not in my family and not in families like ours. <clears throat> it was only in adulthood when I started having my own adult struggles like retrenchment and had a difficult pregnancy with my son. And then it turned out he, had, he was born with two holes in his heart. It was only then that I sought therapy for myself. And it was then that I was formally diagnosed. When I initially sat down with my psychologist though, I believe that I just needed some help to get through some challenging life events. And it was, it was a hard year. Uh, I'd absorbed the belief that mental illness is not for people like me. I've been lucky that since starting therapy and sharing my diagnosis with my family, that they have been supportive. 
there's still a lot of education to be done and I continue to share information with them to help them understand what I go through and I continue to try and encourage them to seek help themselves. There is, however, further challenges in, you know, in that and once you accept that your child has a mental illness or yourself, you know, how do you seek treatment? Where do you go? And do you have sufficient medical aid and budget for treatment and medication? I've, I've been with my mother in the doctor's office where she described depression um, and the, um, the GP said, okay, well, here's a prescription for one month and on your way. And then that was it. And she quit after one month because it didn't work and she hasn't gone, she hasn't tried anything else. So um, there is that lack of understanding. I can't convince her to go back. I can't convince her to seek, seek help from a psychiatrist. Um, so what I wanted to say here is that therapy and psychiatric treatment are still quite expensive and therefore still a privilege of the wealthy. But with continued advocacy, advocacy and policy discussions as mental wellness comes to the forefront, I'm hoping that we can effect change. Um, and that is why I'm so grateful to be part of groups like Global Mental Health Peer Network, to be able to normalize and stigmatize mental illness and have these discussions so that people know that it's people like us, just regular people living, doing our lives, living, working, um, doing normal things. We're very normal people. Um, we just have illness just like anyone else with diabetes or anything else that you have to manage and can't always heal yourself from. And, and I want people to know that it is something that anyone can experience. It, it, mental illness has no barriers. It has no um, barriers in terms of finances or borders or country borders or race or you know, gender, none of these, none of these are free from um, the experiences of mental illness. And we need to seek help. Um, and my hope is that um, we can help people learn how to seek help and where to go if they have struggles and how to recognize, um, you know, that they are struggling and they need to seek help. And I just want to reiterate in closing what Angie was saying is that we need to keep talking about it and that there is no shame and it does not bring down your family name if you talk about your cousin or your sister who has depression, it's, there's nothing shameful in it. And the more of us that can talk about it, and the more of us that um, can normalize it and the more normal people out there talk about um, our struggles. Um, I think that is the biggest challenge that we have today. And um, just particularly to the theme of my story is that it does travel in families and it takes one of us to break that cycle. Um, and that is why I'm hoping we can all continue this discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Leila. You see how cool you are. You just spoke so cool. And uh, yeah, <laughs> tied in with what Angie said. And uh, families struggle. Families um, suffer when they don't... Uh, they don't face what's going on. They don't talk about it. And um, sometimes they don't even fight for it. Because what I know from my personal experience, I lost a brother in 2014. This is a book I wrote about my brother's journey. Uh, my brother's journey from genius to simpleton, battling with his mental illness and coping with his loss. Um, it was so, it was so, I don't know. I didn't care whether I was going to be received well by my family or not. I just needed to, I could explode because the way I loved my brother, I couldn't understand. And then by the time I started to understand mental health, he was gone. So I needed to write this book. I'm somebody who writes a lot. And then gradually, gradually, my family came to terms with what I did. And then also realized that I myself, I have been struggling. I never even told them how much I was struggling right up to my suicide attempt. So it is something that stigma from all angles has dealt with me and has made me to realize that Hey, the earlier you get the grabs on this, the earlier you own it, the earlier you start talking about it, you know, like the me you don't know, the doctor series, and hey, prof, oh, the British people actually helped my mother to, to, <laughs> to have this conversation about mental health with me, because if Prince Harry and uh, Meghan had not sat down for that interview, and it started rolling from there, so I really, really, really want to say it's good for people to talk, especially people in some kind of position, because people will listen and people will be like, yeah, but if they can talk, what about me? There's nothing to be ashamed of. 
And one place where I know people sometimes struggle to hide whatever they're going through is at the workplace, because there you're afraid you can lose your job. How are people going to treat you? You know, from one day to the next, they can stop talking to you. They can fire you for whatever reason. And you might not even feel comfortable, you know. And I don't know if it happens also when you have another colleague. Even if they're not doing something wrong, you just feel like, no, once they have said that, they are struggling with whatever depression, anxiety, anything. Oh, they can cause me trouble tomorrow, so I don't want to hang out with them anymore and all of that. So we're going to listen to Edwin. Edwin is the man. Edwin, you know, men, they like to prepare sometimes. So Edwin has um, his presentation, at least his bullet points. So Zach is going to share that with us. And then Edwin is going to share his own experience. Edwin is another colleague of ours of the Global Mental Health Pain Network uh, from Kenya. Karibu, Edwin, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, uh. Maria for, uh, for that and uh, I would also like to tell Zach uh, I don't think uh, even the presentation is necessary uh, I would like to speak from the heart because I have experienced uh, stigma from uh, from uh, from the workplace and uh, let me share from that angle so that uh, people can understand so I I have a lived experience of uh, depression anxiety and severe ADHD I'm also in recovery from alcoholism now, I didn't know all this. Uh, I actually realized that I was struggling with something in 2015 when I was taken to treatment for my addiction. And my employer was the one who was catering for everything. But now come to the workplace after I got, uh, after I got out from treatment and I could hear some subtle comments here and there. Uh, the, the drunkard is back. Uh, the guy who, has, who is crazy is back. But one, uh, one event that I remember was June 2017, uh, on 7th June, one of the departmental heads uh, said, and, uh, said categorically that they didn't want me to be transferred to their department because they, they didn't want a crazy person and a drunkard in their, in, their, in their department. Mind you, at that point in time, I was actually two years, uh, two years sober. So you can, I, I felt so much hurt. And I had previously had encounters of people calling me names and giving me certain, you know, uh, certain language that is quite inappropriate. But then I, I think uh, being the person I am, uh, and that is one of the things that I always tell people, I, I do take some level of excitement that I know what I'm dealing with. I know that I have ADHD and I can use that uh, to, my, to my advantage. So I decided that uh, I had spoken a little bit about it to, uh, in small platforms about my lived experience, but now then that is when the mental health advocate in me was built. And I started being vocal from the WhatsApp group in our workplace. I started posting uh, information about alcoholism, about depression, about suicide, because in 2011, I, I had attempted suicide. So I started being vocal intentionally. And the name calling still continued. The pain still continued. But one thing really happened. It made me tougher. It made me stronger. You get, and I, I think you can see I'm smiling because I know it has gotten me this far, me being vocal, me being intentional about it. So at the workplace right now, if you come and ask Edwin, they will tell you the guy who talks about mental health 24 seven. Professionally, I'm an accountant, but currently everybody is coming to my office to ask me, uh, is your brother, is my, my brother is having this issue. My brother is doing this. My brother uh, is attempting suicide, has attempted suicide twice. How can you help, you know? And at one point now it's starting to sink in that me being vocal about it, uh, in, even in the, that small space has really started real, uh, making people realize that uh, we need to talk about mental health issues and it is not a cast. Edwin was not cast. Edwin was not, or Edwin did not go through the issues he's going through because he did not pray enough or because he was an unruly kid. So at the workplace now, I'm the mental health champion in, 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 my, in, my, in, my, in my company. I am, I am the mental health advocate who speaks out. When we are organizing something to do with wellness, there has to be a session 
uh, a one hour session slated in every time for me to talk about different aspects of mental health. You know, at times even when they call psychiatrists who, who, are, who are working with us on the, at the insurance level, uh, some of them are surprised at the level of information I have. And then I tell them, you know what, this is what is called lived experience leadership. Because I tell them, I have to speak up. I have to talk about it. I have to talk about it. Right now, I have listened to Prof talk about social contact. And I want to tell Professor that I'm among the first group of Africans who time to change uh, uh, took through social contact. And I am a champion from Kenya and I'm a mental health champion, time to change global mental health champion. And everybody at the workplace knows that. Everybody tells me that I'm the one who is talking to the Brits about mental health. What they don't know is that I was trained to do social contact. Uh, recently, I brought a social contact uh, uh, to my workplace where people, are, we, we, where people with lived experience came and had a conversation with the people at the workplace, including our MD who was even up to date, he's still amazed at the conversations that he had young people talk about. You know, that is how I'm changing uh, the, the work or the workplace. Uh, and Professor, uh, maybe we don't have enough data but I'm telling you work is happening on the ground. I remember we also launched a global toolkit where I did a forward for the same. And I remember my employer saw that toolkit, a friend shared that toolkit with uh, some of my uh, seniors and they were surprised because they didn't know I, I was doing that. Uh, and I was telling them, I, I do it on the weekends, not on a weekday when I'm working for you. And I am that person who is telling people that it is time to talk about mental health issues it is time to change the way we talk about mental health issues. And when I listen to Leila talk about it, and I hear she's, she's a fellow ADHD, I'm so happy and I'm so proud that she can talk about ADHD positively without uh, people calling names. And even if they do, because I know they will not stop, be strong, continue. And that is what I have been at, at my workplace. And I have to be vocal. Uh, at the workplace, I'm supported. There are these support systems, yes, uh, but also I have put in a lot of work in educating the masses because the people who have actually stigmatized me hold uh, master's degrees, which I don't, and they are ignorant on matters mental health. So what does that tell you? That it is up to us who have lived experience to share this. We cannot be stopped. And my parting shot, basically, uh, to, to, to conclude this and to let people know that we have to fight stigma is to tell them that when I keep quiet, stigma wins, and I cannot let that happen. And I repeat again, when I keep quiet, stigma wins, and I cannot let that happen. So in your spaces, do not keep quiet. Stigma hates conversations around it. Stigma will cower when we talk about it. So let us continue doing this and let us continue engaging in such forums, GMHPN, let us continue what we are doing. We cannot be stopped. We cannot be stopped. Do not let anybody, do not let anybody put you down because of the conditions. Let those conditions be what you use to tell people that I have overcome. And even if you are struggling, because at times we have bad days, we are here for you. The community is there for you. Let us talk, let us change the narrative on mental health issues. Because if we don't, who will? We are the ones who are going to change. I remember when the, the, we, we, are doing a, we were doing a mental health policy in our country, people with lived experience were at the forefront. We were aggressive. We have to be aggressive. Nothing is given for free. We have to be vocal. Today it is me, but the generations behind us will, will walk on the foot, will start on the foundations that we have set for them to reach greater heights. So remember, when I keep quiet, stigma wins and I cannot let that happen. Have a good day and thank you so, so much. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to give, I'm going to share two in-house kind of secrets. I know nobody will come after me. The first one is that when I said some people should please talk, everybody was pulling their legs and um, Edwin was the first one who offered to talk. Now I gave Angie the, the leeway to do the program. When I saw Angie put the first speaker herself, the second speaker, Leila, the third speaker, Edwin, you know, I'm an African woman, you know, you want your man to go first or the man to go first. I wanted to get back to Angie and say, Angie, why are you putting Edwin last? But I said, no, well, just let it be that way. And 
Edwin has actually been, last but not the least, actually the most important, he has summarized it. And Edwin's logo for his organization, if you see it there, it says mentally on silence. That is the first thing that drew me to Edwin, like this is so bold. And we've been working a little, he's also an author. He, he, he started a blog and everything, and I'm so excited to encourage him. So Edwin, oh, many women here are saying, go Edwin, go Edwin, go. You know, uh, I don't know. Sometimes when we listen to a man talk, we are tempted to ask if he's single, you know, because uh, but I'm not going to ask you that question, Edwin. I'm, not I'm going happily to married. I'm happily <laughs> married. <laughs> but we don't but have any I am love. very okay, much well, mentally okay, unsilenced. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on. Before I open the floor for questions, um, I hope we have not yet lost Prof because it's also an opportunity for us to show Prof what we do because I'm hoping that he's going to work with some of us to teach us how to put data together and all of that because we have a lot of, what can I say, basic material, but we don't really necessarily know all that methodology and all of those things. So Prof, we are trying our best and um, I just want to show you and show us all a little campaign we did on stigma last year for mental health day in October. It's just like two and a half minutes. And then we will open the floor, all your questions, the remarks, feel free. If you don't want to put up your hand and ask, you can write it in the chat box. And then we'll see uh, if you can go for 20 more minutes. Thank you. So let me share the screen. I had already put it here. So there it is and I can share, okay. Oh, come on, come on, Network, come on, come on. <laughs> Okay, there we go. I don't know how to stop sharing. Let me see. Zach, what do I do? 
<laughs> Are we back? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, there's noise here. So, um, okay, it's time for questions and answers. And I know that more questions will be for Prof, comments and everything. Let's see if we can go for 10, 20 minutes. Zach, please, if you can put the link to the Global Meta Affair Network website, please ignore the noise. If you can put the link in the chat, maybe the YouTube link and stuff like that. So if people want to connect or go and see some things they can see. Uh, Sandra has a question for Prof. Yes, Sandra, you can come on once I open it. If anybody wants to come up, you can raise their hands or you can leave it in the chat box. Sandra, over to you. Excuse me, Sandra, I, I, I need to introduce Sandra with so much more respect. She's the next <laughs> big, uh, regional representative for Africa. So Sandra is taking over for me, and so I'm excited. Hi. Yay. Can you hear me? OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, I just want to say thank you to all the presenters today. Um, your stories were truly inspirational. Um, and to Professor, I have much admiration for what you do and the work that you've done. And for also sharing your story and the difficulties that your mom went through. Um, truly inspirational. As I mentioned, I had goosebumps. Um, a, a couple of tears, perhaps, but um, I've managed to wipe them away. <laughs> But yeah, truly inspirational. And to Marie and to Angelica, thank you for the work you've done over the past year. Um, you guys are really, and I, it's so easy to say these days, but I absolutely you are role models and I'm inspired by both of you, by everybody in this group actually, or in this organization. Um, just with regards to questions, um, nothing's come up um, from, uh, from Facebook. There was a comment uh, from Nemo Wairobi, who says, as a, Kenya, a Kenyan, the stigma is huge with less than 100 psychiatrists in a 50 million uh, population and many whom were private um, is not sustainable. Also, the health structure is helpful to getting support. And she just wrote a book. I think I did share it in the comments as well. Uh, uh, she says it is important that the mental health model in Africa is made to take into account the culture of the nation and ethnic ethnicities, which is obviously very pertinent um, because as we know, uh, cultural differences in different countries is obviously something that we all have to consider. Um, and then she goes on to say there are no supporting systems. And then she says to, uh, to refer to her book, Diary, uh, The Diary of a Nameless Woman, that uh, had stories of a friend and herself and the different and cross-cultural psychologies of hope. Sounds amazing. So thank you for that, uh, Nemo. Um, I have a question for Prof, if it's okay, please. Um, I just uh, am asking, do you think that the stigma surrounding COVID infection has actually aided the plight of destigmatizing those with mental health conditions? Okay, thanks, Sandra. So, um, in fact, I've just published a paper about stigma against not just people with COVID, but people associated with COVID, including, you know, Chinese groups and Southeast Asian groups and so on. So I don't think it's directly to do with mental illness, but it's just another manifestation. So, you know, it could be against people with HIV and AIDS, um, used to be people with leprosy, TB and so on. So it's just another sort of way of people expressing hate. I think that from what we've seen in other domains, is particularly HIV and AIDS, it looks like the same principle of social contact comes through again and again as being the, the way to explore trying to, to actively reduce stigmatization. I think at the moment we've seen some examples of people using uh, very pejorative terms um, about COVID, which really have not been helpful. Also, we're seeing this trend to say, you know, English variant, Indian variant, South African variant, and so on. And in fact, the World Health Organization has put out guidelines saying don't, you know, don't call it Spanish flu and don't call it by a country or a culture. Um, but it's very hard to remember, you know, 1372.2 variant and so on. It's much simpler just to say Indian variant. So what we do, for example, with um, storms in my country, which come all the time in the winter, 
Uh, they have names, people's names. You have Storm Angela and Storm Bruno and Storm Charlie. It goes alphabetically. So maybe we should have simple, you know, names or something for these variants instead. So I think it's really regrettable. We've seen hate crimes, especially against Southeast Asian groups in my country, in the United States and other groups and so on, which is terrible. And, um, you know, I know people who've somebody's been evicted who's from a southeast asian heritage because she was suspected of you know, transmitting the virus so it's horrible so we've got to really eradicate that thank you prof yeah it's important like you say it's it's storms they're just storms that come in and out i suppose and you can relate it to a lot of things in life i think um just looking if there's any other questions um Someone, uh, Diane Kingston has asked, uh, Professor, can we hear about perceived social uh, dangerousness, please? Okay, thanks for your question, Diane. So in many countries, certainly here, perhaps your countries, uh, in the public mind, there's a close link between violence, dangerousness, unpredictability and mental illness. And uh, in fact, when I wrote this book uh, called Shunned about stigma and discrimination, I wanted to look at that directly. So at that time, I wrote a whole chapter about that to look at the evidence. And this is now what just over 10 years ago. But what I could find is that there's almost no evidence for the majority of mental illnesses in relation to violence. So if you look at phobia, panic attack, PTSD, um, autism and so on, there's just no evidence for that. Um, there is a little bit of evidence for some types of severe depression, particularly so-called homicide suicides, particularly, for example, women with postnatal depression, where they might, um, in, when very unwell, you know, uh, hurt a child. But it's extremely rare. And also, people who even thought to think about this a lot still say, well, schizophrenia, you know, is you know the most dangerous, and people are out of control. There is very little evidence that schizophrenia is linked to increased uh, assault behavior or serious violence upon other people. Where there is evidence, again, it's for a very small number of people who either have alcohol or drug uh, use disorder and, um, and what we call antisocial personality disorder and psychotic experiences. And for that small group, I mean, sometimes they are, you know, posing a danger to others. But that's a tiny fraction. The bigger picture is that the people with mental health problems are much more often the victims than the perpetrators of violence. So in terms of, if you like, bust the myth of violence, I think we can, one thing to do is to turn to the evidence and just show that there is very little evidence for that. And the vast majority of people are no more dangerous than anybody else. Um, but also that what we've heard today is personal stories about, if you like, normalizing and that having experienced mental health is just one part of complicated you know, facets of people's lives. And it might be diabetes, it might be hepatitis, whatever it is, and people have treatment and recover and so on. Just to try and speak more and more openly about it. I think that in itself will uh, take the sting out of some of these dangerous myths. We also had, uh, in my country at least, um, strong work with the press and with the media. And 20 years ago, we would often have headlines in newspapers about psychos killer and schizo killer and that type of thing. Uh, we, we never get that now. Um, in fact, most of the coverage in newspapers here um, about mental illness is positive, not all of it, but most of it. And that's gone from long working with media. Uh, we did previously say, you know, here are guidelines, this is about how you report suicide, don't be pejorative. But the guidelines I felt were pretty useless because they were just disregarded by the journalists. What I think has been much more useful is to have an annual mental health media awards event. And this is a bit like a mini Oscars, which is led by an NGO in, in my country, it's called MIND. And every year there are prizes for good reporting in the newspapers, on television and radio, by trainee reporters, in films, in blogs, in vlogs, you name it, a lot of categories. And then uh, celebrities who have an interest or experience of mental health problems then host the event. And then there's a short list and you have clips of their contributions. And it means that the journalists 
actively want to do responsible reporting because they might get a prize and that might help their reputation, their career as well. So it's not a punishing or a blaming approach, it's a rewarding, a positive affirmation for good practice. And I think that's helped to um, really take away the violence um, reporting in the popular press and in the, in the media. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Um, yes, Sandra. Sorry, I was going to not Marie carry on. OK, no, I wanted to um, invite uh, another big sister of mine. Uh, her hand has been on, up for a while. Uh, her organization is called the Network for Solidarity, Hope and Empowerment. I hope she hasn't left us yet. Uh, I am here. I'm here. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Okay, um, I'll start by appreciating Maria for linking me to the Global Mental Health uh, Program. Uh, before joining the, uh, before joining her platform, uh, I'm a peer helper in my organization. Peer helper it means that uh, we talk about mental health. Mental health is something we all. That's some. That's a mistake we're making. Everybody, I think, ninety-five percent of people worldwide have a mental problem, but with uh, different degrees. I think uh, Prof will agree with me. Um, in my organization, we have uh, we have this uh, staff counseling uh, unit where we do case where we talk about it. It's a platform, unlike what Edwin was talking uh, when he said it. Angie, uh, Angie talked about uh, her problem, auto-stigmatization. I think that's the most important. Before she even came talking, I had already made a, um, I made a comment about auto-stigmatization. Uh, individually, we don't realize that we are in pain or we have problems. So uh, I think I want to join Edwin to say there's a lot of sensitization around us. Currently, I'm suffering from... Um, some kind of mental health issue too, because you know, like when people think, people will look at schizophrenia, all these type of big names and think that that's only what mental, you have emotional exertion is a mental disorder as well. It's a mental disorder, if not taken care of properly, you know, like we go down the drain. I have, I have a series of small, small things, which is as a result of things that are happening in my life now. You have, for example, I have a younger sister who's really sick. So it's taking me, you know, like I'm on my toes. So it's affecting my mental health because I sometimes ask, what next? I, I don't have enough sleep. You know, like we need to own. This is just, uh, you know, like we should get out of this platform and, you know, like own, own it. We should own it. We should, you know, like we should stop stigmatizing. Let people understand that mental health, 95% of the world pop population has a mental issue. It might not be something that needs drugs or whatsoever, but it needs sometimes somebody to hold space for you. Marie ho does hold space for me. You know, if I'm really like down, going down the train, I call Maria, say, hey, my small sister, this is what's going on. What do you think about it? This is, this, these are some of the things that we don't need. We don't need to tell people that you, you need to have schizophrenia or whatsoever to be mentally ill. You need to have a problem that you don't have an outlet to vent this frustration. It's troubling you, you just want to end your life. Suicide is not because you have some, some big, big things. That these small, small things that sum up and you just say, oh, my life is not worth it. Just the trigger of an eye and it happens, you know? So these are some of the things we need to normalize the conversation within our friends, our colleagues. Edwin said they call him the mad one. He has owned it up. And now people, these people who even telling you about their brothers and sisters who have these mental issues, they are the ones, they just auto-stigmatizing themselves. They don't want to talk about it. My organization is the organize. I work with the UN in a peacekeeping mission. You wouldn't believe that we have a, a meeting like this, and out of about 800 staff, you have less than 50 attending a meeting like this where we talk about mental health. For me, is that people are really ignorant that they're suffering from it. We're living with it every day, and we need to talk about it. That's the only way to, you know, like to ease the pain because what, whatever we say, I don't know, Prof, you, you might correct me. Whatever we say, even a, a mental health is just like a toothache. It's just like malaria in Africa. It's just like anything we need to take care of it. So that's my contribution. Uh, and I want to applaud um, Angie, Lila, and Edwin for their personal testimonies. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your invaluable contribution. As always, I call her grand sir because uh, she's my big sister. I have so many big sisters. And you know, in Africa, everybody is related to everybody. So Prof, you don't need to, to, to think like how many big sisters do you have? I have so many big sisters, big brothers, aunties, uncles, mothers, fathers. <laughs> so she's a very close one. She has an organization. We work together often. And, yeah, we do hold space for each other too. And I really want to encourage people to not wait until you have a big challenge and a diagnosis and then you say, okay, now I have a mental health condition. So I don't want to be stigmatized. So I, I, I will talk about it or I'm going to make sure nobody makes me feel any less than. As soon as you start feeling like I'm not having a grasp on what's going on. Last Saturday, I was having an anxiety attack. I had a presentation for the next day or three days, but I was already all sick because I didn't have it ready. And in the end, I said, no, just write it in the group. You know, you can't deal with this. This is already going out of control. And once I put it in the group, it felt like a whole weight had been lifted. And then I could watch some Mr. Bean and laugh. I could watch another person's own lived experience. I could go out for a walk and I got the presentation ready the next day and I wasn't late. So whenever you feel like there's a bug coming up in your head about anything, maybe even just the grocery, anything, please do reach out. Don't stigmatize yourself. Don't say, no, people already know me to be such a strong person. How are they going to feel now if they know that I am crying or I'm weak or I'm, I, I can't do this, I can't show up, I can't and all of that. So I, I don't know if anybody else has another question. We've been on for, an hour and almost an hour and a half. That was my forecast, but we can add 10 more minutes. I would really like for Prof to kind of tell us what he has gotten from this. Uh, I don't know if he has uh, attended such a gathering with Africans because I really know that we in our continent, especially the people, I can say grassroots people, people with lived experience, we've had a hard time owning our story, sharing, and um, I think we are over 30, 40 people today. I don't know how many are watching Facebook Live. So um, we are very fortunate to have you, Prof. What is your experience? I love feedback. So I would like to hear from you. Okay, thanks, Marie. So I find this meeting really inspiring and to hear so many people speaking out passionately and eloquently from their own experience across many countries in Africa. Um, Marino, I don't have a lot of experience in most of the countries uh, in Africa. And so this is new for me. Um, I think there is a type of a movement. Um, it's, it's a little bit too much to say it's spreading you know, all around the world. But it's beginning to build up momentum in many countries and many continents. And it's the people who are saying, you know, it's hard not it's hard to speak about this, but it's even harder not to speak about it. And many people who do choose to speak out, to share, to disclose, are finding tremendous support from doing so and sharing the stories and giving support to each other. But uh, I mean, let's not pretend that talking about this is easy because if you talk to a friend and you say that you have experience of mental ill health, then that friend might be compassionate and understanding and supportive, but might not be, might actually reject you, maybe even finish the friendship. So it's hard to know, you know when to take that risk and how to take the risk. So we've been doing some work on uh, sort of guidance for people. For example, if you're talking to a boss at work, how do you begin to speak about mental health problems? It's a sort of um, toolkit. Again, if you contact me, I'd be happy to, to share that with you. It's called Coral, which means conceal or reveal. And we've also been developing this idea of conditional disclosure. So it's not, as you know, it's not all or nothing. So to give an example, a young man who's a patient I treat wanted to find a girlfriend. So after getting to know a particular person for a while, he might say, oh, look at this, here's a, a newspaper article about mental illness. And what do you think? And if the young woman said, Oh, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the newspaper. I mean, my mother had depression, you know, this, it's very common and people should need to get treatment. Then maybe he'll say a bit more next time. And then gradually, gradually say a bit more, just testing the water, putting a toe in the water. But if the young woman who's dating says, yeah, 
you know, they're all mad and they're dangerous. We've got to be careful. And there's a lot of it about and so on. And, you know, you have to stay indoors. Well, maybe that's not the right, you know, the right gal for him. So it means a step by step, just saying a little bit more. Well, I had some issues and maybe then next time you date and then say, well, I, you know, I've actually you know, had treatment and so on. And seeing if the reaction is positive because it can go all wrong. And certainly on social media, if you don't want people to know about all the details of your mental health problem, somebody outs you and, you know, it's worldwide, you can't take it back. So it is, it, you need, people need support to be able to decide if they'd like to disclose and how much to disclose. But I'll just give you one final example. Um, I work with people who are having the first episode of psychosis in, um, in London. And quite often we do rehearsals with people. So a young man was going back to work. He worked in a timber yard where they sold cement and timber and gravel. And he didn't know what to say to his boss. So the staff in my, the mental health team I work, we worked with him and said, um, we wrote a, a, a short story. The story was, I've taken some time out from my career, so time out to think about my career. In fact, it had quite severe psychotic symptoms for several months and recovered quickly. So he went back to work. His mate said, where have you been? We haven't seen you. He said, I've taken some time out to think about my career. They said, OK. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and they didn't want any more information. And to his boss, he did say more. And the boss was really very understanding. But again, he took it step by step. He didn't say everything all at once. He did this conditional disclosure idea. And the boss was supportive. He went back two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, then full time over a few months. And it worked out well. So there are different ways to talk about things, um, but it's, it has many benefits. It also has risks. We have to be careful. So thanks for asking me to comment, Mary. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, before I wrap up, I just have one question which came in from someone. And uh, I want to, before I read out the question, I just want to say that the Global Mental Health Pain Network, um, Zach has put the links there. Um, we once came up with uh, terminology because stigma, uh, some people actually find the words people use to be stigmatizing. And um, I have grown over that, but I do realize that some words can be stigmatizing. And before, when I didn't know better, I was using some words, but now I know better and I use different words. But maybe everybody doesn't know about the appropriate words or people still have some concerns with words. So somebody was asking about um, why it is called a disorder um, because they feel that a disorder implies that you need to change, that you need to be healed and that you are not normal. So you have to do something to be normal. And um, they were wondering if that kind of word will not lead to, uh, will not be a source of more anxiety and depression. Um, so Prof, I don't know what you think, but before then I want to say that, um, yeah, the Global Mental Health Pain Network came up with some words and I was looking for my card on which I wrote those things down so that it stays in my head. And for example, it's not good to say mental illness. You have to say mental health condition. Back then I didn't know, so I used mental illness. You know, um, it's not good to say a mental patient is schizophrenic, a bipolar, a depressive. And then they were talking about the words which are more appropriate to use. So now, Prof, do you think that calling it a disorder poses a problem? Is there any one appropriate um, terminology to use? Or do we just have to forget about the terminology and focus on our well-being? Um, well, how long have you got? <laughs> This is really complicated uh, set of issues, and I don't think there's any right answer. I think that there's there different words, and one of the, or a few of the important things are that we try to use words that show respect and to avoid upset or distress to other people. Uh, the words I use change quite a bit, so I might say mental ill health, mental health problem. Um, with my medical colleagues, I might say mental illness. Uh, I don't think there's any correct formulation. Uh, people working in the disability field will think that uh, mental health and psychosocial support, they'll say psychosocial uh, or emotional difficulties and so on would be the right term. So I don't think there is any correct term here. The, to come to the question directly, the disorder word I think came because people used to think, at least when they're making classifications, that they would be called a disease if we knew that you know, the 
cause of something. So mosquito bites, you know, causes uh, malaria. And they're called disorders, other conditions where we didn't know, you know, the full cause of something yet. But that's old fashioned thinking now. I think it's a battleground of terminology, to be frank. And different places have different words. The words change over time quite quickly as well. So I think the main thing is actually to talk about this a lot and to find phrases or terms or words that are respectful. So I'm reminded that working with um, a leading service user um, here a few years ago, we did a, a project in schools and we talked to hundreds of 14 year old school students, school children. And we said, if you've heard any phrases, any words about people with mental health problems, just shout them out. And we came to a list of 250 words that these children uh, were using or had heard. And when we categorized them, three quarters were negative or disrespectful. So we've got a long way to go to get rid of these. Um, but I don't think there's any correct you know, set of words and phrases right now. The main thing is to talk about it carefully and to show respect with whatever words we are using. Exactly, exactly. For me, bottom line is, well, I have to take care of my mental health. I have to uh, uh, protect my own self and, and as much as I can't really change what's going on out there, I can do the little I can. And um, so that is it for me. And I think that everybody would take away something. And um, my offer or my invitation to everybody is make a commitment, you know, maybe to yourself or to your community to, to do something differently as from today or maybe to do more of something or to do less of something, but it's always good to try to, you know, do better because as the saying goes, when you know better, you do better. And I think that we didn't join this webinar just because we love Marie or we wanted to see Professor Space or we wanted to, we have an interest in the subject from different perspectives and different for different reasons and all of that. And um, I want to say that the, the Global Mental Health Pen Network um, has given me in particular, probably many of us in this network, the kind of wings that maybe we didn't have in our countries, in our families, in, in, or we had, but we were not so sure of how far we could go with those wings. But the network has shown me how far I can soar, how much I can fly. I have this personality, but with the network, it is like there's no limit and I'm not even looking back at my country and all of that. I'm just going. And I really want to thank you so much, Prof. I want to thank um, everybody. I want to thank especially the executive. I want to thank Sandra, who's taking over for me and who was manning the, the chat box here and on the Facebook Live. I want to thank um, Angie, my deputy, my, my walking stick. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Edwin. I want to thank Leila. I want to thank, um, I see Paida. I see so many people. Please, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, those who contributed in the chat boxes. Thank you, Grand Sir, for your invaluable contribution. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, we have newsletters, right? And Sandra, once more, is the one who puts things together and it's there. So if you go to the website, you're going to see a lot of this. Prof, I'm serious. I would like to be supervised by you. So I'm going to get back to you. Trust me, when I want, to, when I put my hand on something, I'm going. I want to do research. We've started with the pay network. Claudia and Charlene have shown us that we can do it. And so we are doing it and I'm not stopping. And Edwin, we are not staying silent anymore. We are talking. We have our own platform now. Whether we are invited on TV or not, we are talking. We are blogging. We are saying, look at me. I live with PTSD, I live with ADHD, I live with OCD. I have been diagnosed with all of these things, but so what? I'm functional, you know, I'm taking care of myself. So um, let's do this. Let's commit to doing better because we know better. Let's reach out because as Prof said, social contact. The pandemic is not an excuse. Virtually you can reach out. You know, as much as you need to be careful with social media, but don't keep yourself away, shut yourself off completely. You know, try to find a balance and um, 
say no to stigma. And well, what else can I say? Thank you so much, everyone. We've been live for like one hour, um, 50 minutes. Thank you so much, Zach. Without Zach, I will be fretting like this. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I don't know what else to say. It's live on our Facebook page. It means that it's going to stay there. You can go and watch it over again. I'm going to go and watch it over again because I was just sweating. I wasn't really participating. So I'm going to go and watch it later. And I think that we did our best and that's all that matters. Thank you. Bye. Bye.